it's fascinating just going back and forth every day from El Alto to La Paz. You get uh, such a glimpse into the things that people are thinking when you're taking it down in the morning. Uh, you see everybody in the tram. Everybody's talking about this horrible uh, genocide, essentially, that's being uh, committed against them by this new government. Um, and then when I take it down at night, I, I sit with uh, racist reactionaries who described uh, the day before the funeral procession, they told me that it was going to be uh, like bugs crawling out of the woodwork. Uh, and they um, described Aymaras as a particularly violent people. Um, and I asked them, you know, whether they saw any, uh, any exit to this terrible crisis. And they said, bala. And that means bullet, which means in their mind, the only way to end this crisis is to just murder uh, everybody who dares resist this uh, new status quo. I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. This is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton here with Max Blumenthal, and today we're joined by a friend of the show, journalist Wyatt Reed, who is reporting on the ground right now inside Bolivia. Of course, on November 10th, many of you probably know that the U.S. government helped back a far-right coup in Bolivia, overthrowing the democratically elected president, Evo Morales. Uh, we're not going to go too much into the basics of who Evo Morales is, his party movement towards socialism, MAS. Uh, if you want to figure out kind of the basics, you can check out some of the reporting we've been doing at the Gray Zone. You can find some of our reports. Specifically, Max and I wrote a report. It's called Bolivia Coup, led by Christian fascist paramilitary leader and millionaire with foreign support. And we talk about some of the figures behind the coup. And then another friend of the show, Jeb Sprague, wrote an article Top Bolivian coup plotters trained by U.S. military School of the Americas served as attaches in FBI police programs. So if you want to figure out kind of the basics, you can check out those reports at the Gray Zone and also the live streams that Max and I have been doing. Um, today we're going to focus on what the situation is on the ground with Wyatt, Riot Reed, and we're going to talk about how the coup regime is essentially s consolidating power um, with the help, of course, of the U.S. So thanks for joining us, Wyatt. My pleasure. Um, so where are you and what are you seeing? So I'm, I'm in, in downtown, downtown La, Paz. La Paz. I have been here for about five days. Uh, the situation on the ground is extremely fluid and extremely complex. Um, it changes, you know, not just day to day, but really hour to hour. Um, so right now uh, we're in a moment that is looking um, not, not great. Um, it's, 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 it seems like it could be a kind of a dark moment for um, those who are trying to resist this U.S.-backed coup. Uh, we just witnessed today um, a dialogue um, in which uh, there were a number of participants and, and um, observers, and uh, the U.N. and OAS are very interested in this sort of thing. Um, and so essentially the um, new coup president, Janine Añez, was uh, seated, uh, seated front and center um, of this dialogue. And uh, it was very clear just from the imagery, um, the symbolism, uh, that she had managed to, um, in many ways, bring previously uh, oppository groups to the table. Uh, so this includes uh, certain um, leaders, at least, of different social groups, different unions, um, and leaders for different zones um, around the country and uh, within the city of not just um, La Paz, but uh, it's looking more and more like the the same government, which you know strong armed Evo Morales into leaving, um, essentially putting a gun to his head and making an offer that he couldn't refuse, 
is using the same tactics. Um, they never stopped uh, to to get people to come to the negotiating table. Um, so unfortunately, it's looking like it may be the case that certain um, leaders in El Alto have been compromised in, in that way and are uh, uh, now and no longer able to uh, really lead any, any type of, of opposition to this new government. Um, but what is, um, but, you know, is cause for optimism is the fact that plenty of these leaders do not speak for the rank and file. Um, so there are divisions within, for example, one of the main minor unions. There's, uh, there's serious divisions between even leaders at the top um, in terms of how people are willing to uh, play this game with this new government. Um, so it's, it's an extremely complex situation and, and it's changing every day. Um, but the one constant is that this government is persecuting and harassing um, really any dissident that they think they can get away with. Um, and unfortunately, that's for Bolivians, almost everybody. Am I, I mean, we were talking a little earlier today and you said that you had an interview set up uh, today with a journalist and you found out that that journalist had been imprisoned and he wasn't just jailed covering uh, protest or in the streets. He was actually hunted by the government as so many other people have been. That's, That's right. right. Um, and, and the, the word, word hunted, hunted is, 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 is a word that, that even, even the government, government itself is using. using. And when, when you combine, combine that with the, the sort of decree allowing uh, total, total impunity for the military to uh, attack, harass, murder um, in at, at least 30, 30 some cases, cases now, uh, anybody who's perceived as sort of disturbing the order, uh, it's, a, it's an extremely uh, frightening situation. And yes, uh, my friend uh, earlier today, he's a... Um, a longtime uh, supporter of, of the movement to socialism party. And he has been hunted um, by this government. And in fact, the day before the coup uh, began, he told me that uh, they came through and searched his house um, and, and trashed the place uh, and that he's been living underground ever since. Um, and, you know, you always hope for the best in these kind of situations. Uh, but I saw him last night, um, and we, you know, we, uh, it was, it was it's always a pleasure, you know, to bump into him and be able to, to uh, find out, you know, sort of what's happening from his perspective. Uh, but then, you know, I said goodnight, and we were supposed to meet today, and now he's in jail, and uh, I have no idea when or really if he'll get out. Uh, and that's the reality, because this government has, you know, not just killed 30 odd people at this people, they, they've disappeared. Uh, um, I mean, people, people are telling me hundreds, I've heard people say a thousand, you really, you have no idea, but you just know that there are people who are missing and you don't know where they are. Uh, so it's, it's an extremely dangerous situation for anybody who's perceived as a threat to this new, uh, cool, uh, government, this this military junta that's now uh, in power in Bolivia. We've seen uh, the arrest of the vice president of the MAS party, the party of Evo Morales. We've seen Evo Morales now uh, indicted by this new government arbitrarily for sedition. Uh, we have seen the shuttering of all TV stations uh, and news networks that are uh, considered sympathetic to or affiliated with Moss and Evo Morales' government. We have seen, uh, from your footage, uh, journalists hounded in the street by other journalists who support the coup, the junta. And, of course, we're seeing um, lots of military repression. Uh, basically, the shooting authorized by the this kind of phony, self-proclaimed president, Janine Añez, uh, you know, giving a free hand to the police and military to open fire, basically a free fire policy, uh, cutting down demonstrators. And you were in La Paz, I think, two days ago, 
when two hours worth of tear gas was just continuously unleashed on crowds, including bystanders. Um, you know, what, how, how would you kind of characterize the, the overall picture? I mean, it, this, this, this seems kind of like fascistic, just an all out campaign of repression to purge Moss or weaken them at the negotiating table to the point where they basically cry uncle. But I wonder if you can describe some of the scenes of repression that you've witnessed and, you know, then put it into, you know, help our uh, listeners and viewers understand the big picture better from these scenes that you describe. Sure. Uh, yeah, the situation um, two days ago was uh, extremely horrifying. Um, and and really, uh, I mean, it was, it was this kind of a situation that uh, it made me think of, of Charlottesville um, a few years ago of just this sort of kind of terror and and absolute you know sheer panic of of people who really had nowhere to run uh so we're talking about what was a funeral procession that was uh descending from el alto which is obviously um it's sort of the the working class sister city of la paz so every everyone who who does the the real labor in la paz um you know, pretty much all live up in El Alto. Uh, and so they have been engaged in, in um, this uh, attempt to, to refuse, um, to, to force this new coup president, Janine Añez, to resign by uh, shutting down the country's access to, uh, to the gas plant at Sencata, um, which is in El Alto. So they've had it surrounded for... Um, for you know, a, a week at least. Um, it's really since the the coup kicked off, but uh, they've been faced with tremendous violence. Um, really, at any moment, uh, it's impossible to say. There's constant surveillance. There's helicopters flying around at all hours of the night. Drones going back and forth. Then this breaks out into um, really massacres. Is the only way to describe them. Um, here in in San Cata, uh, a few days ago, um, the second day I was here, I think on the 18th uh, or the 19th, um, there was this terrible massacre here, uh, where you know at least eight confirmed people died. One more died last night. A student died last night who was originally injured, um, and so now uh, on two days ago. Uh, the families of El Alto decided to descend with these coffins um, and demand justice from from this new coup government uh, in the seat of power in La Paz. Uh, and it was an incredibly peaceful march. It was honestly breathtakingly beautiful just to see ten, at least 10,000. I, I, I would have to go through and, and count the number of people, but it was more people than I've ever seen at a march in my entire life uh, by far. And... They were all really uh, energetic and um, and fired up, but there was no violence. Um, and this is really a, an important thing to remember, uh, especially um, here in Bolivia. We're dealing with uh, really being inundated with this wave of fake news. Now that all the uh, left wing or or even sort of centrist media has been silenced or bought off. Uh, there's no real way for people outside of social media to get access to the truth of what's happening. So uh, people are being told that this was a horrifically violent march, that people were assaulting people and trying to break down doors. I, I filmed the thing in its entirety three times um, as, it, as it departed uh, halfway through and then as it arrived in La Paz. Uh, and I didn't see a single weapon I, I didn't see a single violent incident. Uh, all I saw was really unyielding sort of solidarity and courage. Uh, and then as, as these peaceful marchers took their uh, fallen comrades in their coffins down, um, down into La Paz and attempted to go into the Plaza Murillo, they were violently repressed by uh, police and soldiers, uh, military, 
who immediately launched just a, a totally uh, all-encompassing cloud of tear gas that really uh, lifted up for moments, but as you said, was was more or less a constant for a couple hours in different parts uh, right around the city as they just attempted to find any group of people they could and 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 attack them with tear gas. Uh, and there was no apparent differentiation between people who may not have even been a part of it. I walked past a number of tourists who were just shocked almost and had no really idea what was happening or why they were being tear gassed. Um, and them aside, obviously, the the makeup of this procession was was families. It was almost all families. It was working people, you know, of elderly people, children. Um, as soon as the tear gas let off, I just I started seeing, you know, little kids running past, just you know, their face all swelled up, and it's it's horrifying. I mean, that's. Uh, it, it, it's a chemical weapon attack on 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 thousands of of peaceful protesters that really you just would not let up. Um, and uh, I have been staying very close to uh, the center of of all of this, and I was unable to return for several hours just because the police had militarized everything. They had whole streets blocked off. Um, and as you all know, uh, it's a particularly precarious time to be reporting on all this. Um, and so from my perspective, really, the less interaction I can have with uh, police and with soldiers, uh, the better, because I, I don't think that uh, just based on how they've treated uh, the different journalist friends of mine and uh, and even, yeah, this, this footage that surfaced the other day of uh, a university student studying cinema at La UMSA, the local university, it's very prestigious. Uh, he, um, for the apparent crime of, of criticizing these, uh, these supposed journalists who uh, everyone here in El Alto, at least, uh, everyone who's against the coup refers to them as the Prensa Vendida, the sellout press, uh, because they are really working hand in glove with the military to um, ensure that the coup has um, sort of total hegemony, uh, not just militarily, but also in this propaganda war that they're waging. Uh, and so this was uh, most visible um, watching this young student go up, uh, or he didn't even go up to the journalists, so-called journalists, he was uh, approached by them um, for taking pictures, apparently, uh, and they asked him what outlet he was from and who he was, uh, and he said he's independent press, and and they keep uh, sort of just harassing him with questions that really make no sense why you would ask somebody those questions in a situation where tear gas is being launched left and right, people are being... Uh, you know, uh, physically brutalized, um, that, that these press would be hounding somebody else taking pictures is, is, uh, it's really, uh, I don't have words for it, honestly. It's, it's, it's a complete betrayal of what it's supposed to mean to be a journalist from my perspective. And I think from the working people of this area's perspective as well. Uh, and so these, these journalists sh literally end up shoving uh, this young student journalist into the hand, the waiting hands of soldiers who within three seconds have him incarcerated. Uh, and as is with the case of my, my friend who works with La Resistencia, uh, which has been a very important outlet in terms of disseminating the truth, what's going on. Uh, now we don't know where he is, you know, and we don't know when he'll be back or if he'll be back. Uh, we can only really pray and um, and and do what we do, which is which is uh, draw attention to these kinds of things, um, and hope that there will be enough uh, outrage, I suppose, generated to be able to demand uh, justice for these people. 
Yeah, you mentioned the funeral procession, Wyatt, and I actually have up, for those who are watching, I have up some photos of this incredible, insane event where the military tear gases and attacks all of these protesters at this funeral procession. You can see these photos. There's, there's a, a photo from above of these two coffins just lying on the ground. It's insane. And speaking of that, Wyatt, I mean, all the, the situation you're describing, I mean, for those who know anything about the history of Latin America and know anything about the history of Operation Condor and U.S. policy in the region, I mean, a lot of this, unfortunately, it might sound pretty familiar. The disappearing of activists, the attacks on activists after a U.S.-backed far-right military coup. I'm wondering if you could maybe, you know, as someone on the ground there, talk about how there's a lot of people, when the coup immediately began on November 10th, and in the lead up to it, there were a lot of people, a lot of academics, liberal journalists, even people who claimed to be more left wing, saying that we need some nuance and we have to talk about the situation, um, you know, understanding the, the agency of the people who are against Evo Morales. Of course, we see now that those same people actually helped pave the way for a far-right military coup, and you've been speaking about the, the circumstances. But maybe, you know, as someone who's physically there while this history is being made, maybe you can you kind of reflect on, on the historical context, because what it seems to me is that this is, this would be like, of course, it's not always exactly the same, but this would be like being in Chile in September 20th, you know, 1973, the week after the coup there. And, you know, you're, you're living through this moment where right after this coup, they're, they're, you know, purging and, you know, attacking and trying to destroy an entire social movement. Yeah, it's definitely an extremely unique moment in that sense. And also um, singularly uh, frightening, uh, just in the sense that you don't really know what these people are capable of. Um, and we do have so many historical precedents to look back to though, and especially Bolivia itself. We're talking about the same Bolivian military, which murdered Che Guevara. That's the Bolivian military, which forced Evo Morales out of power. That's the Bolivian military that, um, unlike, you know, Hugo Chavez after the 2002 coup, if he was able to bring them, uh, into line. That that process never occurred here, so it's it's really the same the same Bolivian military uh, that it's always been throughout the years of dictatorship, uh, and then throughout the uh, fourteen years of indigenous uh, socialist governance. No, that's incredible. I didn't even know about that history, and that's a good point. Of course, the Bolivian military helped kill Che along with the help of the CIA, and you made a good point about how Hugo Chavez was able to change the military as someone coming from the military. But one of the points that I'm just thinking about a lot is that, you know, these days on the left, even among many liberals, it's taken for granted that obviously the coup against Allende was a far-right coup backed by the U.S. installing a far-right leader, Augusto Pinochet, a dictator who was in power for decades. But what's interesting is that, you know, that's with the benefit of hindsight decades from 1973, whereas a lot of people still are kind of quiet and mum about the situation, whereas I think five or even fewer than five years from now, two or three years from now, I think it's going to be very obvious to people looking back at what's going on that this was just like the coup in Chile in 1973. And what's incredible is that, you know, you're there on the ground right now living through that. You know, as, as leftists, I think everybody takes for granted that you know, Allende's coup and uh, uh, murder was uh, a terrible, terrible thing. Um, but I think now this is a this is sort of a we get a little glimpse into what it was like back in 1973, and we get to see where people would have stood. Um, and so, for example, there's there's a number of supposed leftists, activists, a lot of supposed environmental activists who really played. Uh, a fairly meaningful role in manufacturing a consensus uh, about the uh, supposed um, dictatorship and, and necessity of, of, of removing Evo Morales from power, um, who did so under the guise of many of liberal or leftist causes. 
you know, I, I don't want to get too personal into it, but it's, it really breaks your heart um, to see people who consider themselves to be on the right side of history actively, actively assisting people who can only be described as fascists um, in, in stealing power from uh, Bolivia's first indigenous president and returning it right back to these white supremacist colonizers. Um, they did that, and they'll have to live with that. Um, but more importantly, it's if nothing else, I think for some of us in the North, this is a, a time to sort of sit back and and uh, take stock of of the damage that can be done um, by simply, uh, you know, in in many people's minds, speaking up for you know the the rights of the earth and the rights of the planet. Um, these these are in many ways uh, more forms of of activism that have become uh, integrated into a larger NGO inter- industry that is riddled with State Department assets um, and people who are constantly on the lookout for ways to uh, to maneuver and uh, uh, utilize uh, popular sentiment and weaponize that against socialists that's uh something that we're really we're really picking up on now and uh this sort of regime change machine that's one of its strongest weapons just as it is in the united states uh and just as it is down here in bolivia people really understand that the the greatest weapon we have in many cases is is media is information um, and so that's why on the first day, um, and really uh, in the case of my friend Oscar with La Resistencia, um, the day before the coup, they uh, went out and, and began their hunt for uh, any, any potential dissidents who might call attention to what's happening um, and be able to explain the truth to the Bolivian people. Yeah, I, I, uh, it, it's also related to the kind of purity politics we always talk about, the ultra-left politics, where no left-wing government in Latin America can be good enough. And so you have these minor kind of Trotskyist-oriented parties that always coalition in the end with the right wing to oust their uh, impure enemies on the left who actually had to govern and stay in power. Um, so I always made the case about Nicaragua and Venezuela that if these coups had succeeded, um, the one in Nicaragua in 2018, uh, or what took place this year in Venezuela, the opposition that would have come into power would have been exterminationist in its mindset and in its agenda. And they would have had to have set out to exterminate these vast workers movements, which would have led to mass disappearances and unprecedented bloodshed. Yeah, Nicaragua. a lawmaker from Voluntad Popular, which is Juan Guaido's party, actually said that they want to implement the Pinochet option, which says everything. Yeah, yeah. and you know, Venice, as um, I think you mentioned before, uh, Venezuela and Nicaragua, you know, they'd reformed their police forces and military uh, to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Um, and then you have like, you know, an opposition in uh, Venezuela that wants to negotiate that's not exterminationist, but the U.S. refuses to kind of allow them to be the voice of the opposition. So now you see what the consequences are in Bolivia, um, in a country that had made so much progress um, economically in terms of social programs, uh, recognizing a majority of the population that had been ignored before and disappeared from public life, the indigenous population, specifically the Aymara. And I mean, where do you see all that going? Um, I mean, you're watching an exterminationist campaign, you're watching a purge before your eyes, but where do you see it going? Will all of this progress be reversed? And what are people saying? What are people telling you who've been a part of that progress? People are scared. People are extremely scared. Uh, They worked incredibly hard to with the the sort of assistance of the Movement to Socialism Party to not just institute social programs, but really create from nothing an entire middle class. People, even those who are opposed to Evo Morales, they can't help but give him credit for <clears throat> for really creating this, this entire new uh, um, 
uh, sort of segment of society that's able to uh, enjoy nice things for the first time. Um, and then, you know, obviously to white supremacist colonizers, like most of the coup's ringleaders, the, this is something that they, they don't think is Indians should be doing, right? Um, Janine Anya's had a, a tweet that was deleted from years ago uh, where she pointed to a picture of uh, original uh, indigenous people and uh, circled their shoes as proof that they couldn't possibly be indigenous because, as we all know, indigenous people must be, you know, shoeless, penniless, live in the jungle and huts. Um, so that's the kind of mentality that the people who've just taken power have, and they really feel threatened when they see indigenous people um, advancing in society and and potentially coming in and taking their plantations and, um, you know, all, all of the things that their great granddad exterminated so many people to earn. Um, so it's, it's fascinating just going back and forth every day from El Alto to La Paz. You get uh, such a glimpse of things that people are thinking when you uh, when I go up into El Alto, I take, it's called the Teleferico, and it's this kind of uh, sky tram, sort of enclosed sky lift uh, that everybody in the city uses to get around, that before uh, the presidency of Evo Morales did not exist, but now uh, has cut people's uh, daily commutes in three or four times or more in some cases, um, because getting up to El Alto by, by car or by bus is extremely time consuming. Um, and so now you get to see every day on, in the morning all the working class people uh, in El Alto take the teleferico down to La Paz to come do their, do their jobs. Um, and you'll get to see in the evening sometimes uh, the sort of ownership class uh, or the bourgeoisie will descend from El Alto back to La Paz. You know, they, they'll have their businesses up there. They'll be making money off of the people there. Uh, but then they want to, you know, live in La Paz. Um, and so you get this range of, of opinions, you know, when you're, uh, when you're taking it down in the morning, uh, you see everybody in the tram, everybody's talking about this horrible uh, genocide, essentially, that's being uh, committed against them by this new government. Um, and then when I take it down at night, I, I sit with uh, racist reactionaries who described uh, the day before the funeral procession, they told me that it was going to be uh, like bugs crawling out of the woodwork. Uh, and they um, described Aymaras as a particularly violent people. Um, and I asked them, you know, whether they saw any, uh, any exit to this terrible crisis. And they said, bala. And that means bullet, which means in their mind, the only way to end this crisis is to just murder uh, everybody who dares resist this uh, new status quo. That says everything alone. And, and that's, I mean, the, it's the mentality of the military. Um, we've seen um, this um, really painful image of a Aymara mother encountering her son in military uniform and beseeching him to stop shooting, to stop the repression. And he tries to comfort her and he's reassuring her, but obviously he's not stopping. Um, I, I tweeted that uh, video out the other day. I don't know where it was, um, but you know, I don't know if you've gotten any insight into what makes the soldiers tick, um, considering many of them come from the lower classes, bonuses. Yeah. Uh... The unfortunate reality is that the way that these coup ringleaders have managed to get so much done is by bribing people. Um, I mean, we talk about uh, the, all the progress that was achieved in under 14 years of socialist governance, but it's only 14 years. That's not enough time to eliminate poverty. We're still talking about a, a deeply poverty-stricken society that has a lot of inequality still. Um, and so many of the soldiers uh, come from working class and indigenous backgrounds. And it is particularly heartbreaking to see them shooting uh, their own community members. Um, 
And obviously, plenty of people uh, have mixed feelings about doing so. But through a combination of bonuses and of, uh, of threats, they're able to keep everyone in line. And I also want to make a note that um, even during the, the, the years in which Evo was in power, I believe in 2014, uh, the Bolivian military is still an extremely racist um, organization. They, in 2014, uh, released from duty uh, some 600 people for protesting against racism. And that's, you know, they purged them themselves, right? They removed these elements that probably may have been a little bit more sympathetic to uh, the working class people of El Alto and of Cochabamba. Yeah, and actually we've seen a lot of reports going around that some of these soldiers and police are being bribed by the U.S. or rich oligarchs who make up the opposition. Specifically, Evo Morales said in an interview with BBC, he said that he kept hearing soldiers on the phone talk about uh, 50 mil palos grandes, 50,000 big sticks, which w was the euphemism they were using for money. And Evo realized that uh, they were trying to actually take him away, the, the military forces, and essentially take him to the U.S. And he also said that the U.S. government, when he stepped down after the military told him to step down in what's obviously a military coup, Evo also said that the U.S. military offered, supposedly offered to, for a plane to send him away. And he said, no, I'm not going to take this plane because it's going to go straight to Guantanamo. So we've definitely you know, seen quite a few reports that they're being paid. And also that you mentioned about how under Evo, for the first time, Bolivia has developed a middle class. This is incredible. I, I have up on the screen here an op-ed published in the Washington Post, of course, owned by Jeff Bezos, the richest, or now the second richest man in the world, uh, just passed by, by Bill Gates again. This op-ed is from October 16th. So this is just before the election and before the, the military coup. And the headline is, Socialism doesn't work? Question mark. An emerging middle class of Bolivians would beg to differ. And the other headline that it uses is, Morales' prosperous Bolivia serves as counterpoint to Venezuela. So, so what's interesting is that before the coup, Bolivia was being used in not just magazines like The Nation, these liberal outlets, but even the Washington Post as an example of socialism in action working. And then, of course, that is why the government was overthrown. It wasn't because uh, the socialist experiment in Bolivia wasn't working. It was because it was working. And as Max and I show in our report at the Gray Zone, the opposition is dominated by many of these right-wing oligarchs and, and elites who controlled the gas reserves that were nationalized by Evo Morales. And let's, let's talk about Agnes again for a second, because you mentioned some of her racist tweets. I have up here on the screen her tweet where she's making fun of indigenous people for wearing shoes. I also have a tweet where she refers to the, the indigenous majority as satanic, and she says, the city is not for Indians. They need to go back to the altiplano. They need to go back to the plains. And then another, that was from 2013, another racist tweet from 2013, both of which she has since deleted. And in this one, she refers to the Aymara, the indigenous population, as satanic. So talk a little bit more about Agnes. And specifically, you were saying that, you know, there's the U.S. government and the OAS and even many liberal politicians, uh, for instance, we saw... Elizabeth Warren and others talk about the transitional government. And the idea was that Agnes would, would allegedly have an election. And of course, whether or not it's going to be a fair election is up in the air. It's very unlikely because they're purging and imprisoning all of the opposition to her. But at the same time, even the idea that there will be an election and that this is just a transitional government, I think is pretty suspect because, you know, as you were saying, it looks pretty clear that this Agnes-led regime, which is really, she's the figurehead of the military junta, is going to stay in power for the near future. Yeah, the prospect that uh, Agnes continues to stay in power is extremely scary to a lot of indigenous people who I've talked to. 
they uh, they've known people like her for 500 years, as many as many people have told me, um, and so they recognize their enemy, and they're um, they're uh, much much easier have a much easier time of identifying who their enemy is than plenty of the uh, liberals or who those who consider themselves leftists in the North do. Um, that's definitely true. Um, it's important to call her, you know, and to call what this is what's going on, a coup. Uh, there's, pl there's plenty of liberal imperialist resistance to doing so, but what's particularly interesting is that there's enough sort of public outrage, uh, and, and I think that uh, this, this is so clear um, to people now that, you know, 13 or 14 of the House Democratic Caucus uh, signed a letter um, very clearly describing this as a coup and then um, taking the Trump administration to task for ta for believing the OAS's report. And um, so this is people like Alexandria Octavio Cortez, who after having met with um, colleagues of Janice Bacadasa, who is this uh, sort of spearheaded the propaganda campaign in the months leading up to uh, the coup, uh, to weaponize uh, a liberal outrage over the fires in the Amazon, the Chiquitania, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, having met with a good colleague and close friend of Janice Vacadasa, is now uh, openly calling out the OS, the OAS, for its role in facilitating what they are describing as a coup. Uh, so it may not mean that much in the grand scheme of things, but in terms of of how liberals are willing to look at what's happening, I think that could be useful um, in terms of pushing people and making and forcing them essentially to reckon with the fact that this is a coup. Uh, they don't have any room to hide anymore. You yeah. know, if if these liberals are saying it's a coup and you say you're a leftist, well, uh, I, I would uh, expect that you're willing to call out a U.S.-backed military coup as well. Yeah, I, I think that's because they've seen the results of the coup, whereas they didn't get to see the results in Venezuela while they're seeing results of sanctions, which are very brutal. And, you know, even the liberal imperialist Nicholas Kristof is willing to acknowledge today that sanctions are actually killing people and starving children in Venezuela. Um, they didn't see the government fall. They didn't get to see the other side, the exterminationism of the popular will party same in nicaragua so we're actually seeing a lot of people call this out i think elizabeth warren even finally said it yeah it does look like a coup um you know so you know i want to she, she didn't even really hedge that much while in the past she'd been you know whitewashing it um it's just so hard to look at and not call it what it obviously is it's also it reminds me of libya where you know, in Syria, you saw the horrors of a dirty war, but in Libya, you actually saw the effects of the fulfillment of a regime change operation. And Obama was running around, you know, without even prompting, saying it was the biggest mistake of his presidency. Of course, it wasn't a mistake, but that's, you know, it just speaks to the larger point. Um, so you're witnessing the effects of it. But, you know, going back to what you said in the beginning of this conversation, where you um, mentioned social movement leaders and you know figures from you know very weakened uh, opposition to the coup coming to the table with Anyes. I mean, how much of that has to do with the shortages? Um, the roadblocks have made it difficult for food to get in, and and you know I, I should mention that the roadblocks are not haven't just been maintained by um, you know indigenous forces and pro Morales forces, but you know I had a friend who was sending me photos from inside Cochabamba. And, you know, the middle class and right wing forces were maintaining roadblocks because of their fear of the indigenous cocoleros coming into town. And so that shut down that city for several days and culminated with a massacre at the outskirts of the city as the army attempted to prevent indigenous people from coming in and making their voice heard. Um, so you have the kind of the country has been kind of shut down. And all of the growth that we saw under Morales has been halted to zero. I'm sure we're going to see some kind of recession in the near future. But I mean, people who are the pro Evo forces tend to be poorer. They don't have anything to fall back on. And so 
how much of that has led them to the negotiating table, just desperation and the need to have the basic uh, goods for survival? Right. Well, that's definitely a significant factor. Um, as I woke up this morning to find out, uh, there had been a decision made to uh, uh, lift the roadblocks um, in El Alto and allow for gas to come out of the Sencata plant. And it's kind of a temporary sort of ceasefire, uh, but it's, you know, they plan on on uh, reinstituting these roadblocks. But yeah, it's uh, somebody who has worked all their life, doesn't have that much of savings, um, as so many working class people all throughout the world are, can't just afford to hunker down for weeks and weeks and not work the way that the <clears throat> right wing can. Um, and I mean, it's not just in Bolivia either. It's it's the kind of situation where it makes it uh, extremely difficult for an opposition that's largely composed of working class people to uh, compete in the same uh, playing field. Um, and so people are 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 very scared right now. And it, it was uh, interesting, actually. You brought up Syria and Libya, Max, because uh, another journalist friend of mine who's Bolivian. Uh, that's really his greatest fear is that is that the uh, empire, the U.S. empire, is going to turn Bolivia into another Libya into, um, and try to do, you know, to Syria what they, or try to do to Bolivia what they did to Syria, rather. Um, well, because all the U.S. ultimately cares about is getting access to the lithium, and of course, Bolivia has 50 to 70 percent of the world's known lithium reserves and the natural gas, so... In their eyes, if the rest of the country goes to hell and there's a protracted civil war, uh, th they don't really mind that as long as they can maintain stability and security, just as they did with the oil-rich regions in Iraq, like Basra. And there's war destroying the rest of the country, but then they maintain so-called security in the natural resource areas. Right. And the natural resources are uh, obviously incredibly important. But again, as with Libya, Bolivia also represented... Uh, up until just a couple weeks ago, according to the Washington Post, a real symbol of what socialism can do for working people if it's allowed to do it, uh, to run its course. So, uh, you know, Libya, like Bolivia, represented a threat to the status quo from the eyes of uh, imperialist uh, governments and uh, the ruling class in the global north as well. So they, they, can't afford to let socialism work, you know, and this has been the case, obviously, since the Soviet Union, since, uh, you know, the Russian Revolution. Uh, they've never been willing to allow for an attempt to see what socialism actually looks like without uh, being besieged. Well, Wyatt, we're coming up close to an hour, so we're going to have to end soon. But I'm wondering if you could just talk about the steps forward for the resistance what are you seeing on the ground in terms of the massive mobilizations? Can those, you know, maintain mobility and will they potentially escalate? And then also, what is the future of the MAS party, the movement towards socialism party? And, you know, do you think it has a future or is, is the goal just liquidating the entire party? Yeah, MAS is really stuck between a rock and a hard place right now. Um, you know, I mean, they are literally negotiating with guns to their heads in many cases. Uh, so they, uh, you know, agreed to this sort of dialogue and sat down at this bargaining table with Janine Añez, who's spent the past two weeks massacring people. Um, and it's really, it's kind of um, very sad to see in the same way that watching Evo Morales take off in a plane, you know, sort of uh, underneath this uh, Bolivian flag was just a very sort of sad image to see because it seemed to represent more than than just what's displayed. Um, so my understanding of, of what the thinking behind this might be from Massa's perspective uh, is that they are making sort of a calculated um, gamble that they are not in a position to um, to re-win the presidency in these, in these upcoming elections, uh, and that their main hope will be to maintain control of the legislature of the National Assembly and be able to keep in check the 
attempted destruction and and reprivatization of all of Bolivia's uh, natural resources uh, and sort of bide their time. And I think the real hope right now lies with the uh, social movements and um, more rank and file folks uh, within unions who uh, really, you know, at this point are are in it to win it and uh, have seen too many of their friends and brothers die to simply uh, give up at this point and and accept some kind of defeat. So uh, that's sort of how I see the situation right now. Fascinating. That, thank you so much, Wyatt. And uh, we'll be checking in with you in the days ahead. We're also looking forward to some dispatches from you to publish at The Gray Zone. Um, everyone should follow you on Twitter. Wyatt's constantly updating with video uh, from the ground. What's your Twitter account? At Wyatt, Wyatt Reed, Reed 13. 13. All right, Wyatt Reed 13. And uh, we're Moderate Rebels moderaterebels.com and patreon.com slash moderate rebels if you want to be a patreon and support this kind of work that we're doing yeah and i have for those watching i have wyatt's twitter up on the screen so you can check that out i also have an article that wyatt published previously that's relevant on bolivia specifically he mentioned the activist janice vacadaza who is a liberal activist who was really helping prepare the stage for the coup. He actually published this article at the Gray Zone back in August, so it shows how this coup was in the works for months before the election. His article is called Western Regime Change Operatives Launch Campaign to Blame Bolivia's Evo Morales for, for, for Amazon Fires. So definitely check out his article and definitely check out Wyatt at his Twitter account. And like Max said, you can support our show at patreon.com slash moderate rebels. Thanks for watching, and we're out. Yeah.